All right, folks, this is uh, chapter 11 if you are in Geo 100. It's chapter 17 uh, if you are in, in Geo 111. Uh, yeah, I'm being lazy, so sue me. Anyway, um, for uh, Geo 100, this is starting our, our kind of final section of Earth resources. Uh, and we're starting off talking about the hydrologic cycle and groundwater. First of all, some definitions. I know we're pretty familiar with these, but uh, the hydrologic cycle, of course, the cyclic movement of water in the Earth's system, right? So, you know, evaporation, condensation, precipitation, flow, surface runoff, groundwater, all that good stuff, right? And also, it's important to remember that water is one of the few substances on planet Earth that at natural Earth temperatures and pressures exists as uh, three out of the four states of matter, at least, solid, liquid, and gaseous state. Uh, another definition, precipitation, of course, condensed water vapor that falls to earth in any form, rain, snow, sleet, whatever that crap is between snow and rain. Right. Uh, and then infiltration, we talked about this before, too. Uh, this is the process by which water soaks into the ground through soil, rock, or or doesn't soak into the ground uh, through urbanization. Right? Uh, and then runoff is the sum of all precipitation that flows over the land surface via, uh, uh, you know, uh, overland flow, rivers, streams, lakes, all of that. Another important definition, salinity, and I'm sure we're all familiar with this. This is the amount of salt in the water, and this leads to two different types of water. We have fresh water, of course, which is low salinity. And then, of course, salt water, which is, guess what, high salinity. It is important to remember that the majority of our, our fresh water does come, though, from the evaporation of salt water from our ocean 70 percent of the surface of our planet is ocean and when you evaporate that water you don't evaporate the salt in the water and then get you know salt clouds and salt rain that doesn't happen you evaporate just the water and leave the salt behind so that's how we get our fresh water the majority of it coming from at some point uh, evaporation of of salt water and it's also important to note that as humans for almost all of our endeavors we use exclusively fresh water not just for drinking and bathing but for industrial applications generation of electricity all sorts of stuff we use almost exclusively fresh water and of course hydrology and, and climate are highly related climate is the strongest influencer uh, on local hydrology especially temperature and precipitation and of course what we see up here is a nice you know uh, um, tropical uh, lots of water. Uh, it's a humid region, right? So a humid region, this is an area with lots of precipitation. We have abundant surface water, abundant groundwater. And even here in Michigan, we are considered a humid region. I know we're not, you know, a tropical rainforest or anything, but we have enough water. We have lots of surface water, lots of groundwater. Uh, it's everywhere around us. So we are a humid region. And that to contrast then with an arid or a semi-arid region, such as this desert over here. And this is areas that have very little precipitation. Uh, and because they have very little precipitation, uh, water is very limited, both surface water and groundwater. Here in Michigan, you don't have to dig your, your well too deep before you get to groundwater. Some places uh, out west, you know, you may be a thousand feet or more before you get down to an aquifer that finally has water. But uh, again, because of that lack of precipitation, there's a lack of, of surface fresh water available. So another definition, monsoon areas, these are areas where you have very, you know, seasonal, prolonged rainfall and the alternating then with, with very dry seasons. And then droughts, of course, are periods of months or even years where precipitation is much lower than normal for a region. Uh, and, you know, out, out here, if we had, you know, a few months of, of uh, you know, less precipitation, it wouldn't hurt us that much. But out west, you know, where arid regions are, they're especially vulnerable because they're already lacking water anyway. So any less water than they expect is, is uh, uh, detrimental. 
Another important term which we hear, but we often don't discuss and not many people know what it is, is relative humidity. And this is basically uh, a measure of the amount of water vapor in the air uh, as a percentage of the total amount of water that that air mass can hold and how much water that air mass can hold is strictly a function of temperature. The warmer the temperature, the more water vapor the, the air mass can hold. So you can have, say, you know, so much water vapor in a mass of air, but if that mass of air is cold, it's going to have a much higher relative humidity than if that same mass of air and that same percent you know, same amount of water vapor uh, was warm, you know, in a warm air, because it can hold more, it would have a lower uh, relative humidity, right? So again, relative humidity, just the amount of water vapor in the air uh, expressed as a function of how much that air can actually hold, right? So as warm air cools then, so as air rises, right, warm air is less dense, it rises, right? As it rises, it cools, as it cools, it becomes denser, and it can't hold nearly as much water anymore, so it becomes super saturated, right? Uh, and then it forms water droplets, which then get together and make clouds, right? When these droplets eventually become too heavy, we get uh, that they can't be supported in the air column anymore, we get precipitation in any form, rain, snow, sleet, whatever. Right. Looking at, uh, you know, hydrology kind of on a global scale, uh, most of our Earth's rain falls near the warm, humid equator, right? So in this area showing this is, is water vapor, the more blue the color, the more water vapor. As you can see, there's just a ton of water vapor in the air around uh, the equator, right? So, uh, you know, the reason is, of course, you know, this very warm air, very warm surface waters, this leads to a lot of evaporation. Uh, that evaporated water, right, is, is now in the air column. And as this warm air rises, right, now it has a high relative humidity, but as this warm air rises, right, it cools, it condenses, and it can no longer hold nearly as much water, so it becomes super saturated and rains out. An interesting effect, though, occurs because of this. So at our equator, right, we have lots of, of, of warm air, lots of evaporation. This is very high relative humidity. But as this air rises, right, it cools, it condenses. Uh, it uh, can no longer hold nearly as much water. So it rains out most of the, the, the water near the poles, right? Now we have a cool, dry mass of air, right? So this row... This warm, wet mass of air rises, precipitates. Now we have a cool, dry mass of air. Of course, cool air is, is, is denser, and it's going to fall down to Earth. But as it falls down to Earth, it warms up. As it warms up, it wants to hold more water vapor. So it sucks any water vapor uh, out of the atmosphere uh, into this air mass and creates... Uh, basically a very dry area and this happens about 30 degrees north and south latitude so at 30 degrees north and south latitudes here's 30 degrees north it'd be about 30 degrees south right the air that has dropped precipitation at the poles again right sinks back to earth due to density right and again here we have a convection cycle as you can see this cool dry mass of air right sinks and warms as it warms up, it picks up moisture, because now it wants to hold more moisture, right? And this results in arid climates, clear skies, and in fact, many of the deserts in our world, right? So here's the Sahara Desert, right? Even the uh, um, um, this uh, uh, Sonoran Desert, the uh, Great Australian Desert, right? A lot of our major deserts lie at 30 degrees north and south and it's no coincidence this happens to be because of this kind of sponge effect where it soaks all of the the extra moisture out of the air right at polar regions we have kind of another uh interesting effect right so at and uh on our poles it's cold the air is cool the water is cool so there's a little evaporation that occurs right so uh, we get dry air right but as this dry air starts to rise right as it goes kind of south it starts to rise uh we get um in fact 
um, another convection cycle set up here. So here now we have, you know, whatever moisture is in this, which isn't going to be much, right? Uh, it's going to cause it as it rises, it condenses. As it condenses, it can't hold as much water, so it's going to rain out and creates often what's called a polar front. This same effect works with uh, uh, what we know as the rain shadow effect. Same thing kind of occurs, but not more of on a regional scale now. And this occurs as you get mountains coming out of the ocean. So imagine this is, is California over here, right? This is a Pacific Ocean. Winds often come off the Pacific Ocean. As they're coming off the ocean, there's a lot of evaporation occurring. So this air mass is going to be humid, right? As it approaches land, now it has to rise up over the mountains. As it rises over the mountains, it cools and condenses, right? Now, as it's cooler mass of air, it can't hold as much water. So it's going to precipitate out all of that water on the oceanward side of, of the, uh, the mountain range, right? Or the front side of the mountain range, right? Now, again, we have a cool but dry mass of air. That cool mass of air is going to want to sink it's going to sink down as it sinks down it warms up right and it becomes uh less humid so or as it warms up uh it wants to suck moisture out of the air right so it's absorbs any moisture that's that's around into that air column and creates a arid dry area which is known as a rain shadow and this occurs on again the back side of mountains we talked this before, but just to remind you, drainage basin, this is the area that's drained by a river and its tributaries, drainage basin, watershed, completely interchangeable. So a drop of water in this red area all becomes part of this stream's drainage basin. The blue area all becomes part of this stream's drainage basin, right? And this works not only above, but also below ground, right, with groundwater, right? So here again is the Mississippi River drainage basin uh, showing you that, you know, uh, again, we looked at this before, how you define a drainage basin really depends on the scale that, that you're looking. So here we could start find one for the Missouri River, we could define one for the Arkansas River, or we could define it all for the entire Mississippi River drainage basin. Right. Drainage divide again, this is just that topographic high spot that separates the two drainage basins. Right. Uh, again, if you are a drop of water, you land on this side, you become this drainage basin. If you land on this side, you become part of this drainage basin. Right. Here in the United States, on kind of a continental scale, we have six major drainage basins. So the first one would be the Atlantic drainage basin. This would be the Appalachian Mountains in here. So if you're a drop of water and you land somewhere in this number one area, you become part of the Atlantic drainage basin system. The Arctic drainage basin, anything uh, in this area becomes part of the Arctic drainage basin. Lots of it goes out through Hudson Bay, but that's not the only place. The Great Basin, this is an interesting one. This is, where does this one drain? Well, this is an internally drained basin, which means any water that gets into this basin stays in this basin. And you can see part of this is the Great Salt Lake itself. So why isn't this just completely filled with water if it, if it, it drains inside itself? Well, it's because it is in an arid area. So this western half of the United States is very arid. This area gets very little precipitation, as you can see by the Great Salt Lake, very evaporative scenario, right? So if this were over on this half of the country, it probably would be a giant lake, but because it's over here, right, in an arid area, it doesn't get much rain, so it's not filling up, right? Then, of course, here's our very own Great Lakes drainage basin, including all of our Great Lakes, right, out the Gulf of St. Lawrence through the St. Lawrence Seaway and into the Atlantic Ocean. This is probably the most famous drainage divide on our continent. It's called the Continental Divide. All sorts of places in the Rocky Mountains you can go and you can see, you know, signs at the top of a pass. Going, hey, welcome to the Continental Divide, right? So this actually is on this side, part five, it's called the Gulf of Mexico Drainage Basin. Anything in here, so this includes the Missouri River, the Mississippi River Drainage Basin, sorry, plus the Rio Grande and a few others that all drain into the Gulf of Mexico. And then, of course, the last one, one, 
the Pacific drainage basin, right? The reason this is called the Continental Divide is if you're a drop of water and you land on this side, you end up going to the Pacific Ocean. If you land on this side, no matter where you are, you end up going into the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, another important thing for us, uh, you know, especially in, in, uh, in arid regions, uh, is to store excess surface water, right? So take some of this excess surface runoff and store it for our own uses, right? And of course, this happens in lakes and reservoirs, but it also happens uh, in wetlands and swamps that can serve pretty much the same function. So if we look at these in, in a normal time dry period, right? So here we have a normal uh, uh, stream flow, small amounts of water are coming in, right? But here we have a, a wet period or a storm event, right? Lots of water now is coming in, right? In both these cases, both, you know, dams, reservoirs, lakes, and wetlands down here, right? It allows a small amount of water to exit. So small amount of water comes in, small amount of water exits. But then when we have a, a flooding event, right? Large amount of water comes in, Excess water can be stored in both rivers, lakes, or I'm sorry, in both uh, um, reservoirs, lakes, and wetland type areas. And the interesting thing is, you know, now still just a small amount of water exits these systems through streams or, you know, in a, in a man made dam, we can very much control how much water um, uh, exits the system. And this excess surface water can be stored for, for later use then. I know I've shown you this uh, image before too, but just to remind you, because it's a pretty drastic or stark image, uh, this, uh, this is uh, our, our planet with all the water, both above and below and in the atmosphere, all the water on our planet, salt water, right, fresh water, ice and snow, all of it. So this includes not only the hydrosphere, but also the cryosphere in this very large bubble right here, right? That represents if we bubbled up all the water on our planet. This middle bubble, on the other hand, this is all the liquid fresh water on our planet. So from this big bubble, we have removed all the salt water, but also all the ice and snow. So this is all the liquid fresh water that is available to us on our planet, which is a very, very small amount. But if you can even see this tiny little tiny bubble right there, can you see him right there, right? This represents all of the fresh surface water we have on our planet so all of the surface water right so this is liquid surface water this is you know all liquid fresh water so what happened to the rest of this bubble right well it's in the ground so a majority of our fresh water liquid fresh water reserves is groundwater right this bubble here again represents all the surface water on the planet this is all the rivers all the streams all the wetlands, all the reservoirs, and all the lakes, including our own Great Lakes right here, which is about six quadrillion gallons worth, and that represents about 20% or one-fifth of the entire world's surface fresh water supply. So we have a lot, a huge chunk of the world's surface fresh water right here, right around us now, and that's a good thing for us, but also uh, putting that much of the world's fresh water supply in one area makes it a lot easier to pollute all at the same time as well. Right. Uh, a few statistics then on fresh water, and we saw those bubbles, but just to break them down a little bit more, uh, of all the water on our planet, only about 4% or so is actually fresh water, and this includes both liquid and solid fresh water, so cryosphere and hydrosphere, right? Um, again, of this fresh water, so of this 4%, right, most of it is locked up still in ice caps and glaciers. About 77% uh, makes up ice caps and glaciers, right? And that's 77% of this 4%. So that's 3% of all the world's water is ice and snow, right? The vast majority of the rest of it is of course then groundwater, right? So again, about 1% of all the fresh water supplies on our planet is liquid. Most of that is in the ground and just a very little bit is left for us, right? So of this four and a half percent, only half a percent is surface fresh water. And this includes all the lakes, all the the soils, right? 
uh, all that's in the atmosphere and all that's in the rivers, right? And biosphere, of course, trace amounts and, and atmosphere. But this should show you, you know, just how little really relatively fresh water we have access to. We don't have access much to, to any of those ice caps and glaciers stuff, right? So we have access really only to 1% of the entire world's water as our, as, as our fresh water supply. Right? And just looking at a map of the United States, right? So this is a precipitation map. Over here, we're nice and green, right? Lots of precipitation over here. Abundant surface water, abundant groundwater. This is a humid climate. For the most part, out west is very arid, except for right along the coastline, which is fairly wet, as you might imagine, right? Uh, and right here, uh, you see this very hot little purple spot. This is Olympic National Park. It is the only uh, temperate, northern temperate rainforest uh, in the world. So there is actually a rainforest in Washington state. Um, uh, gets enough precipitation to be called a rainforest. But why is this part of the, the country so dry? Well, it's because of that rain shadow effect that I talked about, right? So series after series of mountains here, right? Produces series after series of rain shadow effects. So by the time you get to, you know, about here, there's not much water left, not much precipitation left to fall. And our use of fresh water as humans as well, we should talk about that. Um, our number one use of fresh water is not what you would expect. It's not our public water supply, right? This is your, your bathing and, and showering and drinking and even watering your lawn stuff. Actually, the largest user of fresh water on our planet is thermoelectric generation, right? Creating electricity. Uh, if, whether you're talking at a coal-fired power plant or even a nuclear power plant, you're not using the coal directly to make electricity or the nuclear power directly to make electricity what we're using those to do is heat up water into steam and that steam then spins a turbine that rotating turbine is what generates electricity All right so now they're talking coal-fired power plants or nuclear power plants basically what it is is 1800 steam engine technology so that is how we're using the really a, a huge chunk of our, our water supply and then of course irrigation as you might expect is way up there it's our second largest use of uh fresh water as well a couple definitions to to uh, uh make us uh, surrounding water uh first is consumptive use this is water lost or consumed right so the easiest way of thinking about this is of course you drinking a glass of water, but it's also if it's lost to you know the river, the the, the hydrologic cycle at that uh, at that moment. So something like thermoelectric generation causing you know the those uh, um, uh, heating up that water to steam, using that steam to spin a turbine, right? That water then is is consumed or it's lost because it can't be put back into the stream or body of water that that you took it from. Uh, that is called uh, non-consumptive use, and there's a couple different kinds of that. Off-stream use, this is where you remove the water from one source and return it to a different source. So take it from a lake, drop it into a river. And then there's in-stream use, which is you remove it and then put it back into the same source. So something like this would be um, also at you know nuclear power or coal power plants. You need to cool things down. So they have big cooling ponds and, and cooling systems, basically giant radiators that, that help cool things down. And that has you know water, fresh water in it as well, but that's not necessarily a consumptive use. That water can be recycled back into the cooling ponds and then and never used again. So what are our sources then? of fresh water well of course rivers and streams right lakes and reservoirs but then also importantly groundwater and the groundwater is huge we use a ton of it even here in michigan right even where we have abundant surface water um and and abundant precipitation right? and this brings us to a few definitions of groundwater first of all groundwater is water that resides uh, in pore spaces between uh, materials, so in the soil or the rock, right? Those little void spaces, uh, those pore spaces, uh, those can be filled with, with either air or water, right? And, uh, and if it's filled with water, that's considered groundwater, right? Two different zones when we're discussing groundwater. First, the Vados zone. This would be this area up here. This is the 
unsaturated zone or undersaturated zone. This is where you know you may have some water in air uh, in in these these pores, but it's a lot of air. Most of it is you know most of it is air, and and this is not necessarily part of the groundwater. Um, this is uh, down below what we have is is the phreatic zone and this is where the groundwater actually lives this is the saturated zone this is where uh, gravity has pulled water down through the vado zone into the phreatic zone and every single pore here is now filled with water the water table or the groundwater table this is just the boundary between the vados and the phreatic zone it's important to note that this isn't a constant thing right so uh the, the, the water table will go up and down for seasonally. It'll go up and down with, with, with drought or rain. Um, but uh, uh, but uh, wherever that, that uh, uh, distinction between undersaturated and saturated is, that is where the water table is. So if water does percolate down to those deeper levels in the ground, it can become the, uh, part of the groundwater then, right? Uh, and then groundwater flows through the subsurface just via gravity and everything flows just like surface water but slower right it's got all these these pores and, and, and sand and stuff to get around right uh, so it can go for for months to, to thousands and thousands of years before it returns back to the surface and so here we see little pores and here's you know an example of a, a larger pore if you will or a void or cavern or cave uh, this would be again the groundwater so here would be our our fray or our vado zone Right, and then down below the level of the water in the ground, this would be our, our phreatic zone. Right. We've talked a little bit about porosity and permeability before, but I just want to mention it again, and especially in, in relation to uh, groundwater here. Right, porosity again is the total number of holes or open spaces or voids uh, in that rock. Right, so we can have you know, very porous kind of uh, uh, sandstone here, then certain things can, you know, help to reduce that porosity, um, right? Compaction can, uh, and cementation can as well, and it reduces the amount of void spaces uh, in, that, uh, in that material, right? So cement can fill pores, right? Also, it depends on how well sorted the material. So if the material is very well sorted, all the grains are about the same size, there'll be generally lots of space between them. However, if you have a big mix of different grain sizes, those smaller grains will often fill in between the larger grains and block up and choke up some of those pore spaces. We can also create uh, pore space by, uh, by fracturing rocks, right? So not only must pores be existent, but they must be connected stuff must be able to flow through them if stuff can't flow through them they're just stuck in here and here's an example this is like a shale here made out of clay and uh and clays and shales have, have they really do they have a lot of of, of porosity little holes and, and void spaces uh in which water or, or or more commonly oil or natural gas can live but those pore spaces are pretty isolated they're not necessarily connected to each other so it's really hard for for this the material in there to migrate right so what happens sometimes if you can fracture the rock that creates secondary porosity or or or, or creates even more more fractures and, and and holes and now maybe some of those voids are more connected and stuff can flow easier through it and this is what we do um uh, when we do the process of hydraulic fracturing for the recovery uh, of natural gas and oil. Here's a couple other ways we can develop secondary porosity. Dissolution from chemical weathering, uh, jointing, fractures, faulting, all of these. Anything that causes you know, cracks or fractures or breaks or holes in the rock is going to increase the porosity. Right? And of course, porosity is good, but those holes have to be connected. If the spaces are connected, you have a permeable uh, material. So not only is porosity important, but permeability is important as well. And this is the ability of water or, 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 or oil or gas or whatever to flow through these connected pores. And you see here, we have all these pores very nicely connected, easy for water to, to flow right through there. Here's another example. This is uh, permeable concrete, actually. Um, it basically is just a bunch of rocks kind of glued together. And you can see uh, how easily the water just flows right through this material. So this is a highly porous 
and highly permeable material. So here's an example. Here's some permeable rock layers. We can tell because all the water is kind of soaked in. Here's an impermeable layer where all the water has just stayed on the outside and formed icicles. I think I'm going to cut this uh, video off right here. When we come back, we'll start talking a little bit more um, about uh, aquifers, which are an important part of our groundwater.